Probably about the hardest way one could ever imagine of doing pottery, firing things. It struck my imagination when I was a teenager. I was fortunate enough to travel to Japan when I was about 14 years old, uh, probably 1964, uh, traveling to visit my older sister who had moved there with her husband. At that influential age, it was immersing myself in a totally different culture where aesthetics attention to detail and that feeling that aesthetic moments are really critical to day-to-day -day life, no matter which little place they happen to be. But having that attention to detail and aesthetics was an important part of culture and, a part, part of, and it should be a part of everyday life and noticing all the little places where it fit in. And it was an eye-opening experience for me. And that sense and reverence for craftsmanship and artistry. I came back with a different whole perspective in life and it kind of steered me to kind of the direction I ended up going in. From wood firing on this side, yeah. it's a really neat effect with it. It kind of gives it that ancient huh. feel that I'm looking for with those. Trying to look at like something that was made a thousand years ago. He's always willing to share his knowledge, his experience. I learn a lot from him all the time working with him at the college, but also coming to the firings here and same holds true for everyone else who comes here. We always learn a lot from each other. We're loading Gordon's Anagama kiln. Um, it'll take the better part of today. I guess we started about 11 and we'll be finished loading hopefully by six, seven o'clock tonight. And then once the kiln's loaded, we'll light the fire and we'll fire it for three consecutive days, about 72 hours. I generally each firing burn about around five cords of wood, which is enough to heat a huge house for the winter. about the Anagama design is this design to suck up that ash. The draft primarily comes in below the grate so that the draft through the kiln lifts, elevates that ash and it follows the flame as it works its way through the layer of pots in there. And so each time the flame goes past a pot, it caresses it with wood ash as well. And that, once the piece gets really hot, the surface becomes sticky and that ash sticks there. And the ash is the mineral content from the wood. That's why it doesn't burn, because it's minerals. And it's largely calcium and magnesium, potassium and sodium. And those are the main fluxing materials, catalysts for change, in any glass. Glazes melt better in different temperatures and different zones and and <laughs> under no different idea, reduction. And I don't even want to have a theory. So certain glazes at the front will um, will change colors at the front that they wouldn't necessarily do at the back. It really depends on where it is in the kiln, yeah, it right? It depends on where it is in the kiln. <laughs> Oftentimes, the underneath is really quite interesting. It's usually subtle. Right. Um, the you know, bottom, which will be the top this time, right. will um, sometimes there's more textural bit, a little more, more matte and a little more textural. Right. Um, sometimes just a little bit more rough. Um, and then this side will be more nuanced. There'll be more vapors right. uh, going underneath, on, on the underneath side. Part of it is where they'll fit in the kiln based on their height and width. But also, certainly for the people that have made the pieces, whether they'd like them in an area where it's a little hotter or cooler, uh, that'll depend on whether they have glaze or not. And if they're closer to the front, they would get more ash from the fire. 
that would accumulate well the, the the vapors from the ash over the course of the three days so certainly for my work that's in here most of it's glazed it's further at the back because i know it won't get as hot it won't get quite as much ash but it still works reasonably well but for the work we're putting in right now most of it's not got any glaze on the exterior at all and so it's going to rely on the the ash vapors that come off of the the wood as it burns throughout the duration of the firing to actually create the glaze Oh boy. Uh, my son Eli is helping uh, load the inside there and he's going to be doing most of the setting of pieces in the back. So we were just working on strategy of trying to figure out which pieces to put where and um, planning our shelf arrangement to kind of figure out um, the best way to accommodate the pieces. Um, a couple of times we've counted up during the unloading stage and there's been like 500 to 550 pieces in the kiln, varying from really big things to small things, even smaller. So uh, it, it holds a lot. It, it's a very compact, compact and it's a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Planning it, uh, the loading back to front, and trying to anticipate the flow of heat and the flow of flame as it works its way back through all the pots to get to the chimney further up the hillside. The second to last piece here. Yes. going to get a little bit of line of people kind of coming this way. Everybody who's here, part of the firing, which includes you, uh, has to grab a piece of wood. And they go away when you put it in. Yes. Let Rowie go first. Okay, head around and drop your piece in. Push it. Very good. Oh, what the heck, the kids get to do one more. <laughs> We're using ash, we're using the fire, sometimes the fire kisses the pots, um, the ash sticks to the glazes, so it's unpredictable and it's exciting to see. I think it's the unpredictability that's so attractive. We come up for both weekends, we stay the whole weekend and then we come back in about a week and we unpack it and the time in between is packed, just trying to get everything ready. So it's definitely an investment in time. Well worth it though. Gordon is amazing. It's incredible. He's such an innovator and he's such a good teacher. He's patient. I've learned so much and he makes things understandable. Um, yeah, it's just light bulbs go off every time I get to sit and spend time. And that's part of the 
hanging around here for four days. That's so wonderful as we have the opportunity to talk about this, but go into detail about other things and have ideas. Okay. I've already got an idea of what I'm going to work on for next year and found some glazed recipes overnight <laughs> that I'm already working on. So it's really exciting. Okay, we're about ready to stoke. Go for it. Anytime you're ready, I'm ready. So what they're doing now is putting in a couple of good arm loads of wood, about th uh, five or six pieces each, and they're each shooting over to opposite sides of the kiln. Uh, the firebox is fairly narrow but wide, and so they're trying to fill wood across that whole spectrum, capping it off with a little bit of bark at the end. And the idea is to get a nice broad range of uh, wood spread across a coal bed that we've been building up. And how has the fire gone in this burn so far? This has been great, really good. Um, we're much higher temperature at the very back of the kiln than usual, which is a very, that's the biggest challenge of each firing. So that makes me really happy. Well, I, I think there's a commonality amongst potters that are in the community and this camaraderie. And when I approached, I could see that happening. There's laughter, everyone was having fun and um, sharing their experiences with their pots and discussing what was going on. And there was a general excitement about the upcoming firing that was going on. And um, this is my first wood firing. I have done several different types of firings, um, so I was, I'm expecting nutty tones that are robust and have rich undertones and hopefully my pieces will show some of those. I've always wanted to be a potter, so I've known of Gordon for years and years and I watched his first videos when they came out in, I think it was the early 90s and I've watched those and so I was aware of where he was on Demon Island. I've lived on Hornby in the past so I always wanted to have this opportunity so I was seeking it out and trying to make it happen and here I am. Oh, this is like So what it's those? just starting to drop. I think we've reached I can't our peak. I'm cold. I know so, within moments. Um, I oh, <laughs> Heather, we're just going to stoke. Oh, good. Okay. Too dry? Yes. Yeah. Not as far. Well, yeah. Better? Yeah. You can roll it down. Sorry. Yeah. No, I can throw it down. All right. All right. And you want to put the sides down? Got it. Take something out. Yeah. yeah. Are we doing these yep. all? Yeah. Okay. Oh, Straight on? Straight on. Yep. Got it. Perfect. Hopefully yeah. not too far. Oh, sorry. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Okay. Go for it. Do you want me to get the bark for you? Sure. Yeah. Okay. 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 For a sec, Diane. Okay. There you go. Now a special process with the wood firing because you are very in tune with the fuel you're using. It's not just a electricity or natural gas or propane or whatever. It's um, you know something that's growing from the ground um, that you can see being alive 
and um, it takes work to work that you personally have to put into it to collect the wood and stack it and organize it and put it in. And so it's very, you know, it's a very big connection to the fuel and the energy you're putting into the pots. One of the things I try to reference when we start out a firing is that respect for material, that respect for the wood itself, the clay, material from the earth that we've all taken up and manipulated and given our own fingerprint, both technical and metal and from the heart. We combine that and make it preserved. We preserve it by burning trees, by burning fuel. And that respect for every tree, every stick of wood we put in, because that is also another source of the earth. It's every time a tree is growing, it's sucking up moisture, water from the ground, and that water is also absorbing minerals from the earth at the same time. So that gets incorporated into the tree. It's doing magic with the sun, with photosynthesis, creating the cellulose that the tree is made of. And that also adds minerals that the tree uniquely draws up from the ground. Different trees will choose to preserve different minerals, like a wood wood from one tree might be slightly different from another. Wood grown in one location might be different from the wood grown in another place. So it's quite individualistic. So the tree is doing such incredible work for us. It's creating the cellulose, the carbon that it magically creates for us. And we are using that to heat the clay, to vitrify it, to turn that clay into a glassy material, to melt the silica that's natural in clay to get it to fuse and hard and turn back into rock. Anytime. Um, well, the people are awesome. It's a group activity, but it's it's also that um, the whole process is I don't know. It just it just involves nature, uh, fire, water, earth, and the results are magical. You're not quite sure what's going to happen, so it's very exciting. And then you have to wait for six days before you can load it, so it's almost like Christmas waiting for that. Are we good to go? Yeah. Every time it's different, there's always different work, of course, but there's always different people and different types of work because of those people. The weather's usually always quite different. March, when we fired, it was really cold. Now we're out in t-shirts. Um, and I think, too, you know, the anticipation of the work that we've all made, putting in the effort to fire the kiln for three days, and then waiting a whole week before we can actually unload the kiln. That really builds up a lot of excitement. I kind of look at unloading this kiln as being um, just an extra Christmas morning. Yeah, lots of presents, lots of treasures. Yeah. So what are you doing now, uh, Gordon? Well, um, I'm chipping off the mortar that I sealed the front of the door with. Uh, as soon as we finish the firing, I kind of plaster over this front with a mixture of clay and sand. And that just keeps air from getting sucked in all the cracks in the door that we've just kind of bricked up. 
So I'm uh, just it's like unsealing a tomb right now. Just kind of. Get a sneak peek. Yes, can't take a peek in there. I try to leave the door somewhat sealed up, just so that uh, the people, when they come to unbrick the door, they get that sense that uh, this is the opening of the tomb. You know, we are kind of breaking the seals on it. That they get to see this part of the process. Got some more bricks. There's still some pots. I somehow I like looking in while the opening is still really small. It's like a window. Yeah, a little window. A teeny window into another world. Wow. It's better than Christmas morning because you're not quite sure what's going to happen. It's uh, very exciting and it takes all day to come out, so lots of oohs and ahs. But it's wonderful to be able to take pictures with each shelf so that you can see the difference. Fantastic. One more. I can see if you want. Oh, lovely. We've got lots of ash build up on the front pieces and uh, some nice rich ash com combined with some of the glazes as well. Uh, no, it looks great. This is always the most risk prone area. Um, oftentimes the logs will take an odd bounce and hit some of these pieces here. Uh, so this little tea bowl got knocked over a uh, little lug, so it stuck to the piece behind it. Um, there was another one that was over in this area here that I tried to pick up early on in the firing with my long rod and straighten it up. So all these pieces in the very front had no glaze on them at all, just uh, colored slips for some of the blues and uh, glaze only on the inner surfaces. So all the shininess that we're seeing here is just from the natural interaction of the wood ash and the silica that's in the clay. So this one I put up on a little tall wad so I can get more action underneath the piece. Very nice. And nice the way the flame played across the carved surfaces on this tea bowl and then combined with some of the liner glaze on the inside to create some really nice opalescent and lustrous effects. Made a nice really background nice. for the slips. They came up nice and bright. Yeah. Yeah, there's an Eli nice. Does that porcelain have rolling in it too, or is it predominant? Um, I think this one is totally six tile. Okay. I've got one variation that I did throw in a little bit of rolling in it. Yeah. The glaze ran Maybe down the, the handle and created its own little drip, and I just happened to, I happened to like it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the NZ. Still exciting. Get that thing firing like a dragon, it's pretty powerful. Thinman was known for its pottery before I came, which was 30 years ago. It was already known as a potter's community. <laughs> it's been a good place to be. Good clay, good clay country. Ooh, happy, happy, joy, joy. It's also very cozy and warm from the dryer. Okay. <laughs> She's beautiful. Oh, it's so no, we put the. I didn't put the table. Yeah, yeah. Well, you missed it. We need a line, please. It's hot back there. They want to get stuff out. Okay. Oh, it's my uh, <laughs> stamp. <laughs> yeah. That one works. Oh, oh, I like it. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> the pour overs, yeah. Oh, yeah. Pottery is such an amazing thing in that it has developed independently all around the world and different cultures discover the magic of clay and heat treating it. And it's not like 
ceramics came from one area. It was independently created in many different areas, and it's old. Many different cultures, that's our record of their civilization. Everything else, paper, woven, carved in wood, has disintegrated and is gone, but clay is preserved. The fingerprint of that individual artist and that culture's history is preserved in clay. So there's this, in many different cultures, it's like the significant touchstone for their cultural history. And so if you get into old museums, which I'm a sucker for, you'll see that when you get go further back in history, the main record is in carved stone or ceramics, because that endures. So there's always been that reference to history. It's such an old medium, and there's so many different things have been tried independently in different cultures around. There's just a rich background for it. We're always innovating. We're always getting new ideas, trying new things, and sometimes they spring from a little idea from some historical thing that's done, but I'm going to add this little twist to it and turn around here and do something based on history again, but maybe blending in another thread from another culture and integrating that with it and creating something old yet new. Thank you.